Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and Israeli politics are often very complicated, to say the least. But as we approach Israeli elections on April 9th, the scene has suddenly become more and more chaotic. On February 28th, the Attorney General of Israel, Avichai Mandelblit, announced his intention to indict Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on criminal corruption charges involving bribery, fraud, and breach of trust. At the same time, there are major realignments on the Israeli political scene. In addition to Likud and Labor, there's a new party, Blue and White, led by former General Chief of Staff Benny Gantz and Yair Lapid, who formerly created and led Yeshatid. Naftali Bennett has left his Habayat Hayyudi party to create the New Right Party, joined by Ayala Chaked and Carolyn Glick. Sippy Livni, who was apparently thrown under the bus by Avi Gabay, has announced her retirement from politics, while Avigdor Lieberman continues to head Yisrael Beitenu. And of course, there's a coalition of ultra Orthodox parties, a coalition of Arab parties. And then a fear developed over Mr. Netanyahu's encouraging a far right political party, Otsma Yehudit to join a coalition with the Jewish Home Party, formerly Naftali Bennett's party, to create a potential coalition government run by Mr. Netanyahu. Otsma Yehudit espouses the philosophy of the late Rabbi Meir Kahana and his Kach party, including advocating the removal of Arabs hostile to the state of Israel. And on and on and on. Well, to help us sort it all out, to give us some perspective on the Israeli scene, I am delighted to be joined once again by one of the most astute observers of the Israeli political scene, a veteran Israeli diplomat who served as Israel's former ambassador to the United States, also served as Israel's deputy foreign minister, Danny Ayalon, who many of you know from his superb series you see here on JBS, that addresses the myths and canards relating to Israel called The Truth About Israel. Currently, Danny Alone is a journalist, a commentator on Israeli life and politics today. He writes, he's a visiting professor of Israeli politics at Yeshiva University and Stern College, and he's a dear friend, and it is a pleasure to welcome you back to JBS and L'chaim, thank you for joining us, my dear friend. L'chaim. I'm Israel Chai, I always say. My Israel pleasure. Israel. How have pleasure. you been, first of all? Very well, very well. You know, Israel, with all these uh, malaise in the political realm, is doing well economically, technologically, strategically. We can defend ourselves by ourselves and uh, with all the challenges we, we have. And, are you, and you're well. And I'm well. And you're traveling here with your wife, Anne. Which is really a great blessing, that absolutely. Is sure, sure. Our uh, daughters now are old enough that uh, my wife can join me here. Where are your daughters in life? So my youngest one, she's in the army. She's in the paratroopers. She's a paratrooper. Yes. Do Very you proud worry of for herself. Her? Yes, but you know, I'm not any different than any other Israeli. And you were there too. You were there too. I was there too. Yes, yeah. I was there too. And your other daughter? <clears throat> my other daughter. She's out of the army. She was a sharpshooter in the army. Now she's a uh, personal trainer. Uh, they both uh, still live at home, which we're happy about. And they are staunch uh, Near Tel Aviv. Near Tel Aviv, yeah. right, right, right. So it's very, very nice. And then you travel here to teach? Yes, it's a nice, it started as a nice gig, you know, two months out of the year. And I've been doing it now for five years. I really enjoy the students at uh, Yeshiva University. And uh, really they love a, you. It, oh, they well, adore you. you. And you know, it's interesting. Uh, you've been on JBS a lot, but you're also, you're hounded by American television, by other Israeli television. 
And uh, so you're doing a lot of that as well. Yes, I do it. Uh, I call it like as a service to the public. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I was blessed with uh, my career to be able to really work for our people, to represent my country. So it gives you a lot of insights and experience. And when I'm asked to, to give any, any uh, commentary or uh, to defend Israel, because there's so much fake news against oh, Israel. Danny, so much. So I'm, I volunteer. Every time I'm called, I, I try to, to, to make it, especially in foreign media. Yes. Um, I mentioned already, you do Truth About Israel, a series of, I don't know, three, four, five, six, eight minute videos that always deal with another canard, another theme yes. of criticism of Israel. Uh, and that has been received very well, not only here on television, it's online. I hope everybody sees it all the time. Yasha Koch, it's a Thank fabulous you. job. You. You're, you know, the first time you and I met, you were deputy foreign minister. And you were visiting New York. You were with Avigdor Lieberman. You were in his party. And you impressed me so much. And since then, you and I have, you and I have done so many things together. Yes. And I am so grateful to you for all you've done to help me. Not only will oh, you help me understand better, and you're just the loveliest. Oh, you were so Denny kind. Daniel alone is the loveliest, oh, sweetest yeah. person in the world, in addition to being this amazing mind and insight. So, Mark, I'll come here anytime. Uh, and by the way, I was very impressed. I remember very well doing this in your former studios in Fort Lee. Yes. We had a big schlep, but we did it. You did it all the time. And now I want to congratulate you. This is the first time I'm here in your new studio right here in uh, Manhattan very close to Times Square, in the midst of uh, all the media yes. uh, happenings. So, uh, well, this is a, th for you as thank well to you. you. This is a second home for you. Just remember that. <laughs> OK, you know, you and I said off camera, and the audience should understand, we are, ha we are taping this on Thursday, February 28th. It was just moments ago, practically, that the news came out that Prime Minister of Israel is about to be, it, it, there's an intention, he has not been indicted yet, but there's an intention to indict uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. And you and I said before we went on camera, this is a sad day for Israel. Yes. And I really need some perspective yeah. that you can bring. I want to understand, I want our audience to understand, what does it mean in Israel, under Israeli law, for a prime minister who is still in office. We had the case of Ehud Olmert, but he was not in office, right. okay? Right. We had the case of an Israeli president who was tried for sexual misconduct, and he was sent to jail. But what's it mean in, you're not in Israel today. I want you to imagine, Danny, what would it be like, do you think, in Israel today? And Israel is a spirited, it is a political astute. There are arguments all the time. There are debates all the time. Anything that we think goes on in America in terms of arguing, argue, we don't hold a candle <laughs> to Israel. But I want you to just speak for a moment. Yeah. What do you think it was, it's like in Israel today? And what's it mean for a prime minister to be about? Do you, I expect him to be indicted. Do you? Yes. OK. What's it mean? Well, first of all, it really is. As you said, Mark, it's a very sad day. I would say it's, it's a tragic day. I spoke with many of my friends in, in Israel. They are either shocked, even if they are political opponents. Uh, nobody is really uh, gloating about Even his opponents are not gloating about it. You rightly so mentioned it's the first sitting prime minister whom is being indicted. However, if we will start a little bit with a maybe more um, procedural thing, uh, which is important. The legal stuff is important, but we will talk about the political as well. You have to remember that um, the indictment is conditional. It's indictment subject to hearing. See, everyone is, uh, has the right for a hearing. And the hearing is where the lawyers of the defendant, this, in this case uh, Netanyahu's lawyers, are trying to actually rescind, to repeal, to change the decision of the Attorney General. So they're going to have some meetings with him, and this takes time. And uh, when it comes to a sitting Prime Minister, the uh, hearing 
can take months, if not even close to a year. He's very busy. First of all, now he has campaigned to run. And after the campaign, presumably he will, he will win and he'll have a coalition to build. And then running all the, the affairs of the, of the state. So it may take a long time until the hearing Just is the over. hearing itself. Yes. And historically, I mean, there were some precedents that hearing overturned the initial decision. Mm -hmm. So it's not over yet mm -hmm. for BB. So all those who are BB sympathizers, <laughs> it's not over from a legal point of view. Mm -hmm. And we'll have to wait for the hearing. Uh, but of course, the legal aspect, I would say, is the narrower aspect because there are political implications. And the political implications are that we have already heard some of the opposition. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, General Gantz with the blue and white, that he will not sit with Bibi in a government if, uh, since for him it's like a fait accompli, which is really not the case. But you know, we, we you political, know, I've heard that before. Po exactly. Political exploits, we know, we know people say something in the campaign yes. and, and, and yes. then later. Also, if we can go back to the, uh, to the legal, and uh, it's important, just to, such a few details. It's not, it may be boring, but it's important. The, according to Israeli law, if a sitting cabinet minister is indicted, he has to resign, but not a prime minister. Prime Minister has by law to resign only if convicted. And people will say, it doesn't make sense. If a minister has to uh, resign, you know, they say Kalva Homer, then of course a Prime Minister. But the, the rationale of the, of the law here is that when a minister has to resign and he has to go and he has his day in court, and let's say he is exonerated, he is found not guilty, he can resume his post. Mm -hmm. A prime minister cannot resume the post because once he is out of the, the government, the whole government dissolves. And let's say after a process of a year, two years, he's found non-guilty. You cannot really get the, 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 the wheel back, and that's unfair. This is why the law allowed it. But Mark, again, the issue at the end of the day will not be legal. Because if, if and I say God forbid, because we don't need it for the, for the country and for our, our people, if he is indicted finally, that means the hearing will not uh, change the Attorney General's decision, then even though he doesn't have to legally resign, the political pressure on him and on his coalition uh, partners will be so much that they will push him out. Mm -hmm. And I also suspect that also some political power, powers within Likud will be joining in to push him out. So that would be a very, very sad moment. But again, as, as I said, the, the way I see it, um, there is a long way, a long uh, it's interesting. legal way. So you're saying it is possible. He could run, he could be elected on yes. in, this, in the April elections, yes. and he could lead a coalition government for a period of time yes. while the legal process continues to unfold. Yes. And then at some point, if it goes badly, he may have to resign. Right. I think, also I hope, the audience understands. The comment you made is sophisticated, but it is so true. It's true here in America as well, you know. Very often they talk about, right now, there's always talk about whether Donald Trump will be impeached. He's not the first president to face yes. that. We lived through Nixon, we lived through Clinton. And then there are those who argue, well, you know, there's nothing that Donald Trump has done illegal, even if one day it's proven there is some kind of collusion with Russia. But it doesn't matter whether it's illegal or not. Political pressure, a political reality, yes. is a force beyond any even of law. And it could be that a political reality would push a president out of office or push a prime minister out of office. And that's the point you're making. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, the anticipated indictment suggests various kinds of crimes. Of all the ones that are mentioned, do any for you seem to be more serious than the others? Well, Mark, I've worked with Netanyahu. I was his foreign policy advisor in the late 90s on his first term. I think I know him. He's not corrupt. He is not corrupt. And, you know, money was not exchanging hands. In his 
as I know him, you know, he never thought he did something wrong. He really did not. I, I believe so. This is why you see him coming out, you know, claiming innocence so vehemently. I, he really believes it. So there are three cases. One, of course, is the, the case of uh, getting all these um, gifts. Yes. Um, it seems petty to me. It is. Yes, it is a little petty. Okay, champagne. I don't want to hear about it. it. Is, Champa yeah. Champagne and cigars, that should be the worst thing any politician ever does. That's right. Go to That's number right. two. Another, the number two is when uh, the, uh, the claim is that he tried to bribe his uh, way to good media. Yes. And basically, case number two and number three are about the same uh, charge except with different media. So uh, one is when he was caught on tape. And the one who recorded it, the taped it, was his chief of staff at the time. And he asked him to, to tape it. So you know he didn't think he was doing anything wrong because okay. who would in his right mind yeah. ask to be taped if he is suggesting Absolutely bribe? Absolutely right. Now this is the case with Bezek. This, no, this is the, ta the case with the, the newspaper Yediot Aharonot, which uh, is the, yes. was the largest. Uh, yes. And the, the claim is, and also you see it on, on the, the exchange, is that you see um, there was a rival to Yediot Aharonot. Yediot Aharonot used to be the, the, the main paper in Israel with the most distribution until a new guy came uh, in the block, and that was Israel Hayom. Israel Hayom uh, became very popular, really rivaling Yediot Aharonot. And this is Sheldon Adels. This is Sheldon's, right, Sheldon Adels. It's also a free paper. It's a fr exactly. It's and a free paper. There are those who argue that's why it's so popular, because it's free. Yes. I'm not that's sure that's true. The bottom line is, however, it took over the role that once Yediot Akhrenot had. Exactly. If Yediot had, uh, quote unquote, some kind of monopoly, no more. And where it hurt the most was the advertisements. And, and yet the odds started to, to really lose money. And, uh, and the, the you know, publisher of Yediot, a very uh, strong man in Israel, behind the scenes, you know, he was kind of the, you know, I would say, What's his uh, name? Um, Moses, Noni Moses. Uh, he is uh, like the Rasputin behind, you know, everybody was afraid of him because he could really bring people up or down just by a headline. And all of a sudden, you have Israel Ayom, Sheldon Papers, which counters that. So he really felt it, for first of all, on an influence and power, and secondly, maybe more importantly, on his pocket. Mm -hmm. By the way, when they say that Israel Ayom is given uh, up uh, free, it's, 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 I can tell you that there are more Yediot uh, Achronot papers that are given free as well. You can see it. You go into a train in Israel, you see Yediot Achronot all over. It's free. So um, in any case, there was, the, the, so the claim is, and you see also, you can hear it on record, that Bibi Netanyahu, and this was before last elections, the elections of uh, uh, 13 or 15, I can't remember, before the last election, where Bibi Netanyahu comes to um, Mr. Moses, the publisher, and says, listen, I will make sure that this uh, paper of Sheldon will come down in distribution, so much so that you will cover the slack. But in return, I want good cover coverage on, on your thing. And of course, this other guy was very happy to do it. And so this is where the, the attorney general sure. says it is a bribe uh, where he gets, the Yediot not gets. And what, I know what he, I know what, Mr. Netanyahu offers Bezek, but what does he offer, how does he, how does he intend to decrease Israel Hayom's That's circulation? That's a good question. That's a good question because I'm not sure he was uh, consulting Shelton Edelson about it. And I believe... And Shelton's a big supporter of, of BB. Yes, but I'm not sure that uh, Shelton supports him today as he used to before because Sheldon didn't know about it, and that would have really um, been unfair to Sheldon, which is a great benefactor uh, of, of Bibi. How he would have done it, I'm not sure. Maybe he thought, maybe Bini Netanyahu thought that if he would ask Sheldon to do it, Sheldon would have done it. 
But uh, again, nobody okay, can tell. I have a hard time with that one. I know. Go to number three. The number three is another uh, medium in Israel. It's called the Walla. Walla is a, one of the largest uh, news, um, media, digital news. You know, they have a website which is very popular. And the owner of this news site, Walla, was also the owner of Bezek. Bezek is like the Israeli AT&T or... Uh, it's the largest it? telecom company the in The largest world. telecom company. And here it's a little bit more complicated because the charge here is that Bibi, as Minister of Communication, see, he was also Minister of Communication, which I think was a mistake from his part. As the Minister of Communication, he passed regulation or actually he avoided regulation by, by which Mr. Alovich from Bezek Shaul Alovich. Shall, yes, really benefited. And the benefit is, I don't want to go into the details, the benefit to Shaul Alovich by a decision of the Minister of Communication, Bibi Netanyahu, actually was worth a billion shekels. Yes, it's incredible about yes, money. To Mr. Alovich. Yes. And in return, Mr. Alovich gave... Uh, this is the claim. Yes. Gave Bibi Netanyahu and his wife Sarah good coverage on their website. On Walla. Yes. Okay. By the way, if, if someone in government changes regulations to help a business in order to get something good from that business, in this case, press coverage, that's problematic for me. It absolutely is. But again, what I think um, from Bibi's perspective, I think he, he was, it, it, I think from him, it was legitimate. He, you know, because me. how? Because how could that be legitimate? Because most politicians meet uh, media moguls or meet uh, publishers of papers or uh, other media, and they discuss it, but they are not caught on tape, and maybe it's not as blunt. You're right. In, in this case, because of this regulation, this was something that is uh, maybe out of the ordinary. Um, but again, knowing Bibi, he is not corrupt, and he didn't think it was. I think he thought it was normal f in the in the context of relationship, which are very complex between the media and leaders, just as you see here in the United States. Yes. All right. If there were no scandal like this about Bezek, Idiot Achanot, and champagne and cigars. Would Bibi Netanyahu win another term? Yes, I think he's going to win another term in anyway, spite of this. Anyway? Yes, I'll tell anyway? you. Yes. Because <laughs> his voters believe that he is being persecuted by the Attorney General. And that the Attorney General has caved in the political pressure from the opposition and from the media. Is there political pressure? On the Attorney General? I don't think so. I mean, I, the Attorney General in Israel is quite independent. Uh, but this is how, let's say, the, the public defense line of Netanyahu would be that he's being uh, persecuted. Um, that's what he said already today. Yes. And, you know, we discussed it. We saw how he, uh, I mean, it, it was really very sad to see him, you know, where his voice was cracking at one point. Uh, but he really believes, and his voters believe, that he is being persecuted. He is being treated unfairly because, um, again, without looking into the, the nuances that we discussed, they say, well, he didn't get any money like Olmert. Olmert got envelopes with money. So they say, well, he is treated unfairly, so they will come and support him in the ballots. And you see it by the polls. Likud is still very high there. And although we have a new, you mentioned, we have a new party, uh, um, Blue and White, which has a very strong showing. But in Israel, the game is not who has the largest party, but who can build the largest block of the coalition. And right now, it's still Bibi Netanyahu. Okay. I'm going to tell you what I experience. I want you to comment on it. I experience this when I am in Israel, mm -hmm. and I certainly experience it as an American Jew. You talk to Israelis, I regularly hear the following. I don't love Bibi Netanyahu, but there's nobody better 
to protect the state of Israel against hostile forces in the Arab world. And he's done quite a good job with the economy in ways, and he's opened up relationships to other governments that are going to be good for Israel, and we have relationships now with the, Emirates, the Arab Emirate states. Yes. And therefore, although I don't like him, I'm going to vote for him because I think he's best for Israel. There's nobody better. To what extent is that what you hear? And is that a problem which we also have, incidentally, here in America? Very yes. often you'll hear, I don't like him, whoever it is, yes. whoever it is. Yes. But there's nobody better from my perspective. Right, right. Okay, I want to know the extent to which you feel what I've described is reality and why it's so. Yes, it is a reality. He is considered a good prime minister, and he has brought uh, a lot of achievements, especially when it comes to foreign affairs and diplomacy and also defense. Uh, I think that uh, his policy towards uh, the Iranians in Syria was very courageous and successful. The same thing is his uh, decisions vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Palestinians. Uh, foreign uh, policy, I think he's the only leader today that can really show up and discuss kind of face-to-face -face with both Trump here and Putin in, in Russia. And as you mentioned, uh, Mark, uh, building coalitions in the region that would have been imaginable a few years ago. It's not that it is all because of him. You know, uh, there are geopolitics that change. You know, the breakup of the Arab world, the threat from Iran on Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries brought them to us. But he knew how to take advantage mm -hmm. of this and manage it very, very well. I have my only issue with him, and the economy is doing well also. The only issue that I would have with him is that he, he was not very inclusive. He was not generous enough towards the opposition. And, you know, Kiruv, uh, I mean, putting Jews together, even if we have differences, and it's legitimate to have differences. And, and here, I think he was just too much pushing the other side. Um, not that the other side is, you know, uh, was all uh, unblemished. But this is the only thing that I, I feel a little bit of kind of a, um, a, a spoiled feeling. But he, he is a good prime minister. He is a good prime minister, and people understand it. Okay. Americans should understand that Israel has a parliamentary system. Yes. I think many Jews now get it, but I want to make sure those who might not understand. Basically, there is a parliament of 120 seats, the Israeli Knesset. To govern, you must be able to put together a coalition of 61 or more, which gives you a majority of seats in the Knesset. Right. And traditionally, the parties that have ruled Israel, have governed Israel, have had, I don't know, 65, 68, 63. I don't know the last time it was over. It, was there ever in the 70s? When it was a um, national unity government, Shimon Peres and Itzhak Shamir in the 80s had a, uh, a national coalition government with a rotation as prime minister. They had over 90 mm -hmm. in the Knesset. Yes. Okay. Was that good? I'm not sure. It was a stalemate. I'm not sure either. It was a stalemate, yes. yes. But basically, it's a, a government governs with what's normally seen as a narrow yes. majority, correct? Yes. Recently, Prime Minister Netanyahu's coalition was like 61, 62, right? Right. That seems to me to be so narrow. It doesn't speak of strength. I'm not talking about political strength. And... When you were in the, in the Knesset, you were in the coalition government. What was your coalition number? Do you remember? It was around 70, 74 even. That's much stronger. Yes, it was a strong. And uh, again, uh, the Knesset I served in uh, actually had four years. Yes, so four years. Four years. You so fulfilled, for, right. For once, we had a full term served. Yes, yes absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yes. My point is... While Netanyahu has won a record number of times, no one has served as, for prime minister as long as many terms as he has, including David Ben-Gurion, who was and came and went and came yes, back. Right. But 
it doesn't seem to me he's been able to put together a politically strong coalition that can withstand you know, the political winds here and there. Why is that? Because the Israeli public is divided. And uh, the Knesset is merely a reflection of uh, the, the, the thoughts in the Israeli uh, street. And basically, if you look at, um, let's say, the main divide is ideological right and left. Two-state solutions, no two-state solutions. Uh, this is the main thing. Uh, Israel is not a normal country in the sense that uh, we don't vote uh, on our pocket, as, uh, as you would here or anywhere else. For us, uh, security is paramount, is survival. So this is the main, uh, I would say, dividing point in, in the political uh, arena. That's very interesting. Those who would vote against Netanyahu, what are they voting for? They're voting for a two-state solution. They're voting for uh, far-reaching compromises to the Palestinians, including divided Jerusalem. They believe, and again, I don't fault them of... Uh, uh, they, they are Zionists. They are good Jews and good Zionists, but they have a different view. They believe that this will give Israel more security. I don't think that they are realistic. They really are, you know, they, it's like a wishful thinking that if we gave the Palestinians um, enough, they would stop hating us and they would stop their objective. I don't think this is the case, but there are many good Israelis on the left who think this way. This is legitimate. But most Israelis do not think this way, and that is why Bibi Netanyahu could have served in office uh, for so long. Even if we have a, uh, almost a, um, you know, a, a, a division where the left and the right are almost the same, you know, like 61, 59, it's very close, but the, inherently the right wing has an advantage because the left when they are, let's say, if the Knesset is divided 60-60, right and 60 to the left, the left includes about 13 members of Knesset who are Arabs, which are Arabs, and they do not see themselves playing the game. They don't want to be in the government. They don't want to de legitimize the Israeli um, government and the Israeli and the Jewish state. So in order for the left to have a coalition, they would have to use the religious parties. And the religious parties for many years, they were the balance. Sometimes they were with the left, sometimes with the right. But as long as now they have put their, uh, let's say, put their uh, fortune on, on, on the right, I don't see much chance for the left to form a government. Unless Likud will really drop down and some of the smaller par parties which go with Likud will realize, okay, if Likud doesn't have a chance to form a government, well, let's jump ship to the other mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. But this is politics. Okay. I want to push you for one moment. If the Arab parties have roughly 13, 14, 15 seats, and the left at the moment has, let's say, for argument's sake, 59 total, but 13 or so are Arab, then in terms of Jewish Israelis, it's not 59. It's more like 45, 46. Exactly. So all of a sudden, it's 61 to 46. Exactly. OK. I am surprised that you would say to me, virtually 50% of the Israeli people believe that land should be given away to, a, to the Palestinians even under present circumstances, where the Palestinians are violently, actively murdering Jews and calling for the destruction of the State of Israel, and where Hamas, and to some extent Fatah, they argue from the river to the sea. Anytime somebody says from the river to the sea, there's no Israel. You're telling me that you think somewhere between 45 to 50 percent of the Israeli people believe they will win by giving Palestinians a state under current circumstances? Yes, and this is called democracy. So anyone uh, that accuses us of being, you know, quote-unquote apartheid and all this, this is just 
vilification. This is just a political warfare to undermine the Jewish state. Now, among this 50%, as I mentioned, 25% of this 50% or more are the Arab Israelis. That unfortunately, their leaders do not see uh, Israel's, um, let's say, uh, concerns and interests uh, in mind, but they want actually to undermine it. And again here, I don't know any country in the world that would let members of its own parliament to speak from the pulpit about the destruction of the, the country that they supposedly represent. Uh, I don't know if any other country well, it wouldn't would, be allowed in America. Ish, certainly, they would be thrown to jail, not in Israel, because we are for free speech, you know, a, a free uh, press, uh, democratic rights. There is immunity to elected officials so they can speak their mind and sometimes do something which are treasonous. Okay, I want, I have a problem. <laughs> yes. I don't think it's because Israelis are dedicated to democracy. I think it comes back to the insight you had a moment ago about how politicians can or cannot survive scandal. And even if the law is not the, even if the law would not sweep them out of office, the realities of politics and public opinion are stronger even than the law sometimes. And I believe the reason why there is tolerance of the Arab parties in the Knesset is not because Israelis are committed to free speech. It's because there's a political reality that Israelis believe on balance. It is better to have them in the Knesset making noise. They don't have power than to make an issue internationally and to somehow say, you know what, sedition is not acceptable. And if there are Arab members of Knesset calling for the destruction of the state of Israel, that's unacceptable. Israel would like to say it, but can't. And the reason why I think I'm right mm -hmm. is because when it comes to parties on the right, mm -hmm. Israel all of a sudden is perfectly willing to deny them free speech. The party that is, a, that is supposed to be the inheritor of Kach. Mm -hmm. If there are Israelis who believe in a, in a, in a Kahana-like posture vis-a-vis -vis removing Arabs from the West Bank, and by the way, they're only talking about Arabs who want to destroy Israel. They're not talking about wholesale right. moving of Arab population. Right. What they say is, if there are Arabs, if there are Palestinians who are actively advocating the destruction of the state of Israel, they don't belong here. We want them moved out. Now, Israelis as a whole may say, I'm sorry, we're not going to do that. But for Israelis to say, we won't even let you in the Knesset, seems to me to be a revelation about what is, is and is not a reality about Israeli politics and the Knesset. That in the end, it's not about free speech. It's about the fact that when it comes to the right, Israelis don't like it, you can't say it. But when it comes to this crazy Arab reality of Arab Knesset members getting up in the Knesset and arguing for the destruction of the state of Israel, Israel tolerates it not because of free speech, but because of the political reality. Mark, now you, you, what's your assessment? First of all, you're too wise and smart, and uh, you know the facts very well. But I would say a very simple answer. You know, the taste is in the pudding, not in the, what is put in there. And whatever the motivations are, the fact is that Israel is a democracy. What Ariel Sharon used to say, we are more democracy than any other democracies in the world. And this is really the truth. And um, whether it's because of political reality or not, the fact is that not only major majority rules like any other democracy, but minority rights are very much upheld. And these minority rights, which include the Arabs, who are about 17, 18 percent, uh, gives them, you know, the right to vote, to get elected, 
to the to the extent that the okay, Arabs have, have the third, you know, the, the third largest block party in the Knesset is the Arab Knesset. Yes. Now, uh, why we do allow them that? I, I think part of it is is being Jewish, you know, being Rahman or Rahmunes. I, I, well, I don't know what you're talking about. And where part in of the it, Jewish tradition do you allow people to argue for your annihilation? I know it's crazy. There's no Jewish value. There's no, no Jewish value that says that. Not at all. But the fact that we uh, uh, let them have the free speech, this is something that okay, is... Okay, uh, I just want to know one thing. Should Otsma Yehudit uh, have free speech? Should a, should, if an Israeli wants to vote for Kach, should Kach be allowed in the government? It's a matter of, you know, if, or depending what you say, you know, the difference between free speech and incitement could be very, very fine line. How are the Arabs not inciting? Well, the Arabs are not in, they are inciting. So? Of course they are inciting. But we're going to let them But the Knesset. thing is, when they run, see, they're also very smart. When they run to the Knesset, their campaign, they don't say, oh, we want to ruin the Jewish state. They don't say it in the campaign. When they are elected in the Knesset, and when they go overseas, they don't say that, oh, we, we want to uh, uh, ruin the Jewish state. They just say, you know, the Jews have no legitimacy. The state should be either, you know, a state of all its nationalities. We should abolish the, uh, the issue of Chok uh, HaShavut. That means Jews should not have the right to come to Israel. Palestinians right of should have should the, the right of return. Well, the right of return is to the Palestinians. So what they preach, really, is in a very sophisticated way, uh, to abolish the, the, the state. What was the, the problem with Kahana was that in his campaign, he talked about hurting Arabs or, uh, and, and that was kind of what bothered the, the Supreme Court, basically. It was their decision. Um, so he was stupid. In a way. He wasn't as he, cunning as yes, the Arabs. Yes, he wasn't politically. Okay, and what about Otsma Yehudit? So Otsma Yehudit, again, you have to see what they're saying. And it is to the extent that they not call for a killing Arabs. To the extent they've not that, called for killing okay, Arabs. Okay, so if they don't say that uh, you know we are better than them, that the Arabs are um, you know uh, not humans, or if they don't say that, if they just say the land belongs to us because we belong to the land, this is fine. If they say if they if they say well we want to push them, you know uh, in a, in a forceful way. This is not our way, you know. It's ve'ahavta et ha'ger ve'et ha... Excuse me. There is no such thing in the Jewish tradition. Of course there is no. There's a ger, to kosh, there's a ger toshav. Absolutely. A ger toshav is to be treated like the homeborn. Absolutely. You treat the stranger like the homeborn. Absolutely. As long as he's a ger toshav. Right. A ger toshav is defined by someone who wants to live in peace. Exactly. With the Jews. Exactly. Under Jewish... Political law, Absolutely. not religious law. Okay. Right. That's not what we're dealing with here. Of course. There's so, no gear to shop right. here. So here we really have never really looked into it in a serious way. What do you do with a gear to shove who wants to your destroy harm? you? Yes. That's not a gear to shove. Okay. So okay. now that's so, a rodave. Okay. And you understand what a rodave is? Of course okay. I know. Din rodave is a yeah, pursuer who course, wants to kill you. What Jewish law say your obligation to the rodave is? Well, hakam Obligation. Hakam leorgecha, hashkem leorgo. That means your obligation is to defend yourself, to defend your family, and kill him before he kills you. If it's necessary. If it's necessary. If it's necessary, you kill him before he kills you. Is that a Jewish value? I think it is of the course. just, yes, I but think it is the Jew. right one. It sure. is the transcending Jewish value. Transcending Jewish value is pikuach nefesh. Absolutely. Pikuach nefesh is you save life, beginning with your own. Sure, sure. Anybody who wants to live with me in peace, mm -hmm. embrace. Mm -hmm. That's what the Jewish vision says. Right. If they want to kill you, then as sad as it is, it's sad, it's tragic. You must defend yourself. Absolutely. Even if it means taking you that know, life. You can go to the extent of, you know, Din Rodef, even on a, an embryo. Yes. If the embryo uh, uh, risks the life of his mother. Threatens the mother. If, if he threatens the mother, he you is must. to be killed. By the way. It's so we don't do it to others as we don't do to ourselves. Exactly right. So I'm only saying that it's very easy, and I, I say this gently to you. 
you're a very, you're not only lovely, you're very ethical, and you are looking for the ideal. But very often there is a lie being told inside the Jewish community. The lie is that Jewish values require you to embrace somebody who wants to kill you. That's not a Jewish no. value, ever. No. And I'll say this again. Any Arab, any Palestinian who wants to live in peace with the State of Israel, the State of Israel has bent over backwards to say, you're welcome, we'll treat you like a homeborn, and if there is a second-class status in Israel, as there is in every country in the world, we'll fix to make it better and better. But don't come and tell me you want to destroy me and expect me to accord to you all of the rights, privileges, comforts that would be to I totally okay. agree. And I, I don't totally hear agree. that ever being said by rabbis. What I hear rabbis saying is sort of what you said, because it's facile and it's easy. It's not true, though. And it's time for Jews, especially rabbis, especially somebody like Danny Aiello, to tell the truth. It's a sad, sad, tragic human situation. And you know what? People want to kill you, Danny. They want to kill me, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I have no obligation to make myself more vulnerable. And I will not allow them to make you more vulnerable, or your wife, or your two daughters. I'm sorry. You know what is the, the, the real issue here? PC, yes. political correctness, which actually prevents the rabbis or any other leader to speak in blunt terms. And uh, as, as the values go, you're absolutely right. It's, this is the pure justice as you can think of, to kill someone before he kills yourself. Yes. If somebody is trying to break into your home with a gun, and he points a gun, a gun to your baby's head. Not only you have the right, you must kill him. Absolutely. We tried that, explaining the explanation of this into the world. They don't accept it. You know, I, I can tell you from my own. Why? I'll tell you. Why? Because we're Jews. <laughs> uh, they, yes. The, the, the short answer, it's anti-Semitism. I'm sorry. It I'll is. tell you uh, an example from, you know, my own experience. Please, please. You know. After 9-11, and a lot of radical Islamist terrorists in Brussels, and decapitating uh, heads of policemen in uh, London, and, and Paris, and whatever, we went to the Europeans, you know, to denounce it, to work together, and we said, you see, now you should understand us better. What do they say? No, it's not the same thing. What do, what do they mean? They say, terror against Jews is legitimate. Terror is against us is not legitimate. And we say, listen, terror is terror is terror. You cannot distinguish. We are just the canary in the mines. They do not accept it. And what is the reason? Anti-Semitism, fair and square. And this is the world we live in. So we have to understand that sometimes you have to be um, firm. Certainly you have to be firm on the ground. And we will never, ever compromise Jewish lives on the ground. Even if we are being bashed by all the world, we will do what we need to do. But sometimes you have to kind of play around like Bibi did in a marvelous way. Eight years of Obama with the most brutal pressure, going all the way to the Arabs and, and the, the Iranian and the worst enemies of Israel. And what did uh, Bibi do? He had his speech in Bar Ilan talking about the two-state solutions and other things. That, but in a way, in a political way, that it can be ambiguous enough that you can continue and do uh, differently. So why don't we say that? I think we should, but we don't because we know what is the, mm -hmm. the response mm -hmm. from the others, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Maybe with all of us would speak in one, one voice, and this mm -hmm. is something which really I feel frustrated about. Is about the Jewish community in America not speaking. I, again, I don't wish them to speak in one voice. First of all, we're Jews, you know, we don't have one voice. Every Jew has at least two, or if not more. But there is a legitimate criticism of Israel, its policies. But the, the legitimacy stops when the questions are about the right of the Jewish state for self-determination as a Jewish state, 
for their own homeland, for their right for self-defense, for defensible borders. And this I see many on the left that criticize that, the very, and, and they question the very legitimacy of the state of Israel. I think this is wrong. I think this is um, actually it's, it's suicidal because all of us have the same fate. If they don't understand it from history, then I don't know when they will. But uh, nobody will uh, uh, really distinguish between a religious Jew, a secular Jew, if he's a liberal Jew, if he's a conservative Jew, if he's J Street, if he's, uh, I don't know, M tier 2, whatever. And this is something that I think we should work more on all sides about meeting one another, about discussing things and agree what is outside of the pale and what is not. Uh, and all those who criticize Israel on, on um, policies, it's fine. Although we have so many criticism around the world, we are self-criticizing ourselves. That why would we need more? I don't know. Uh, you don't hear any Palestinians criticize Palestinians. That's, uh, that's also something that we <laughs> need to, to think. But that, let's say, OK, you have to you have a burning desire as a Jew for tikkun olam, which is fine. You know, we know what it is. But to go against, uh, against the Jewish state, uh, I think it's, it's morally wrong. I think it's politically stupid. And again, I think in some ways it's go to the extent of almost suicidal, uh, suicidal um, I would say, tendency. I think you say it perfectly, and I think you put your finger on the biggest problem facing Jewish life today. The biggest problem is the extent to which there are Jews who just don't understand anything about Jewish history and don't understand how, what, it, what it means to be part of the fate of the Jewish people. And when you talk about where criticism is appropriate and inappropriate, I could not have said it better, and I try to say it all the time. You know, in my family, I have the right to be critical of anybody I want to be. I'm not going to tolerate you telling me about my family. Inside the state of Israel, we said this already, there is such debate, heated argument, to worry that there is no Haaretz in Israel. There is Haaretz in Israel every single day. And whether Haaretz now represents 15% or 50%, it's a, vo it's a voice that speaks from the, from the left in a clear, critical voice of whatever thinks, what, it, what Haaretz thinks is on the right. American Jews who feel it's their obligation their responsibility to tell Israel where they're doing it wrong from you know, their comfort in Manhattan and LA and Atlanta and Stanford, Connecticut, please. And all they do is give fuel to the anti-Semite. And that's what hurts me the most. Yeah. You know, I, I say to, I say to people I have enormous regard for. What do you gain by criticizing Israel in public? What do you gain other than giving the anti-Semite the ability to say, oh, but you see what he says? So I, I think what you're saying is very, very important. I can tell you one thing. They gain no respect. Which is interesting. They think they're winning respect. Yes. I, I would not respect anyone who really ridicules his own People. people, yes. It's a, like, uh, I, I would think it's uh, e either he's doing it for self-service, uh, to, to be kind and to be loved by others. And it could be for a short, for a short time, he they would get a lot of uh, uh, standing ovation because of the interest to bash Israel. But in the long run, there is no respect for those you. who are. I agree with you. By the way, how do you self-define yourself? on the political spectrum. I mean, you were, with, you were with Lieberman. You've been with Netanyahu. If somebody said to you, oh, well, Danny Ayalon, you are certainly center-right or more right than center-right, to what extent would you say, yeah, you've, uh, that's true. H how would you define yourself, self-defined? 
I would say center, center, right, the, the entire center in Israel moved to the right after the second intifada, after the far-reaching offer of Ehud Barak to Arafat in 2000. Not only they, they rejected, but then they attacked, if you remember, with all the suicide bombing. More than 1,000 Israelis were killed, which is, you know, in, in proportion, it's more than 9-11 here. So Israelis understood. Uh, more so, in 2008, people do not uh, really remember that very vividly, but Ehud Olmert, another Israeli prime minister, offered Abbas, Abu Mazen, not only the same as uh, Barak to Arafat, even more so, and he just disappeared. So today, the Israeli center is not what it used to be during the Oslo years, because at that time there was you know, a euphoric sentiment. People really wanted to, to, to believe it. In 1994, 95, when Israel gave as a, as a, uh, as a, a prepayment, as an advance payment, 40%, you know, 40 of Judea and Samaria, 40% of the West Bank, Area A, is Palestinian. With Palestinian Authority, they vote for their own uh, legislative and all that. At that time, 80% were for a two-state solution. Today, 80% are against. Okay, talk to me about that for one moment. Because I want to make sure you and I understand each other. Mm -hmm. Are you against the two-state solution? At this point, absolutely yes. That's not an answer. Let me explain to you. Mm -hmm. And I don't want you to be misunderstood. And sure. Israelis are, and are misunderstood all the time. The answer to my question is, but I want you to, you ask me the question. Are you for a two-state solution? Of course. Now ask it's, me, now ask me, is it, is it achievable at the moment? Mm. The answer is no. Yes, and I'm not about to do anything that's suicidal. Very good. But in theory, of course I'm for a two-state solution. If the Palestinian tomorrow, if there was a messianic change in the Middle East, and, you know, there was a Palestinian leader who somehow was able to stop the education that's being taught in Palestinian schools, stop what's being taught on PA TV, stop what's being put on PA television, stop this pay for slay, stop vilifying the Jew that we're from monkeys and ape and, right, right. Okay, and pigs. If there was a radical, radical change in the Palestinian community, if there were Palestinians writing in the New York Times editorials saying, of course the Palestinian must create a two-state solution, if there was a Shalom Achshav in the Palestinian world, if there was a sea change, and all of a sudden the Palestinian said to me, we'll live next to Israel like Canada lives next to Israel, well, the United States. It'll be no different than the U.S.-Canadian border. We have no desire to do anything but live with the Jew in peace, and the Jewish state should thrive, and together we'll create this regional Gan Eden of economic and social and intellectual power. Of course I'm for that. And I believe no less than 85% of Israelis, including Dan alone, would so say absolutely right. You're so not against the two-state solution. What you're against is a two-state solution under the present circumstance. Mark, I thought like you during the 90s in the Oslo. Since then, we have gained experience, we have matured, and it's not that simple, unfortunately. It's Why not did I say that simple? Wait a minute. It's not that simple because when you talk about two-state solutions or one-state solutions, it's like a zero-sum game, either or. This is not the case. You know, diplomacy, politics is the art of the possible. And I maintain today, after also studied other uh, models, political models in the world, it's not the only model. There could be a model of autonomy. There is a model of uh, confeder uh, confed you know, confederacy or co confederation between uh, let's say the, the uh, Palestinians in Judea and Samaria and Jordan. Some would say the two-state solution is already existing. Jordan is the Palestinian state. Some would say that. So, so what you're, you're saying is something that is kind of an axiom, it's kind of a paradigm that may need some... Okay, rattling. so what you're saying to me is 
that if the Palestinians were willing to live with the state of Israel, as Canada lives with the United States, you'd still be against the two-state solution? Not necessarily, but again, the question is, I, one thing for sure, I will not give up. Because it's not just a matter of giving the Palestinians something they never had in the past, uh, in the history, a Palestinian state. It's also, what do you expect from your own, the Jewish state? For, for instance, the Jewish state is not a Jewish state without sovereignty over our Temple Mount. It was Jerusalem that kept us as a people in 2,000 years of exile. The minimum we can do now is keep Jerusalem and guard Jerusalem. Okay, you can have it. Now if we you have say? that, okay, now let's start with that. So if, if Jerusalem, right? If, uh, it, Temple it, Mount, you didn't talk about Jerusalem. You said fine. Temple Mount. Okay, Temple Mount. The, you want to let East Jerusalem be the capital of the Palestinian state? East Jerusalem. Wait a minute. Let's talk about other things. Defensible borders. That's given. That's a given. Okay. So That's a given. You're going to live next to Canada. Don't talk about defensible borders. You've got to take my messianic assumption here. They no longer want to kill us. You know when I will start believing in what you say? No, it's not about <laughs> when. I'm asking you a theoretical, <laughs> philosophical question. You and I don't believe this will ever happen. I don't believe it will ever happen. The Messiah will come twice before it happens. But, in theory, if the Palestinian ever said, we were wrong, 100% wrong, we want to live with the Jewish state, and we mean it. So I'll tell you something, not only in theory, but in practical terms, something that has happened. You know, the fact that Israel wants peace I mean, it is. It, for us, it's a Jewish value, right? For us, it's not just an interest. It's a value to yes. make peace. It's not just a strategy. We, can, we proved it. We gave Sinai to the Egyptians. Sinai is three times the territory of Israel for real peace. We gave areas to Jordan that were under dispute for peace with uh, uh, Jordan. Bibi Netanyahu gave most of the parts of Hebron to the Palestinian Authority. So we did that. So we cannot say that, you know, so theory, okay. What I'm saying is that we have wisened up. You know that uh, with this uh, two-state solution, you know, it came out of Europe and adopted by Bush and his administration Excuse in, in 2003. It came in 1937. With oh, the well, okay. right, right, Since right. 1937, right, the right. Jewish world right, right. has said, we will share the land. Absolutely. Okay. It's 37 and, the, and 47 absolutely. and 67. Absolutely. And the Arab world has said, over my dead right. body. Right. Or as right. I like to say, what they're really saying is, over your dead body. Mark, I think you're much more right-wing than I am. <laughs> I'm not right <laughs> The audience is going to think I'm right wing. Now. Thank you very much, Danny. I love. I am not right wing. You're, you're I, center. I, no, you're center. I, Dead I, center. I, I agree. Yes, and when you said to me, Absolutely. that the the Israeli community has moved, I I, I just I just think the, that it's it's sort of what you have said. We've yes, all grown yes, up. Yes, yes. We've all been disillusioned. But you know what escaped us for a long time. In 2003, this is why I want to go back to the two-state uh, roadmap to peace. Yes. The roadmap to peace. You were part of that. I was part of it. And why I was part of it, the headline for roadmap to peace was two states for two peoples. Right. Find the Palestinian who would say two states for two peoples. There is none at the moment. They say in two essence, states. In none. And what do they mean by two states? Two Arab states. That's it. No Jewish state. Okay, but you know you're not, you're not getting any argument from me. Okay. I've said to you, the Messiah is going to have to come twice. I'm only saying, it, however, that do I want to reject what, ben -Gur, what David Ben-Gurion and the Jewish, and the Yeshuv and the Jewish agency, and what we said in 47, and what we said in 67 at Khartoum? Are you telling me that that was all a lie? It wasn't a lie. The Jew has said from the very beginning, right. there are two peoples here, it is ours, but you know what? The best way for this to work is we'll share the land. The Jews yeah. said we'll share the land. Had the Arabs accepted, we would have had two-state solution long, long, long time ago. ago. Long ago, right? Yes. As Dershowitz said, they could, have had, they could have had 19 years already, 20 years. Right. They could have right. had 30 years already, right. 40 right. years already. Right, right. Absolutely. And, and, I, you know, and then when you, so when you say to me, 
50% of the Israeli people are for a two-state solution today? I say to myself, you're wrong twice. Mm -hmm. I believe 85% are for a two-state solution, and nobody's for it now. <laughs> Who's for, but wait, if Herzog had won in the last election, leading labor, would he have done anything different than Netanyahu? No. Explain no. why. Because, it's very important. Because there. what he would have done, the first thing, is to go to Ramallah or invite Abu Mazen to his uh, office in Jerusalem. They would start some negotiations, and when a real offer was made on the table, let's say Herzog would have bring to the table the offer of his mentor, Ehud Barak. Itzhak Herzog, Isaac Herzog, was the cabinet secretary of Ehud Barak. And he would have come with the same plan. And Abu Mazen, in this case, would have just laughed at him at his, at his face. Herzog would have come back home and say, sorry, I tried, but I didn't make it. Yes, he Absolutely. would have tried, but he yeah. would have not. As, if he couldn't have gotten yes. what you and I want, what every Israeli wants, doesn't matter whether you're labor or Likud, doesn't matter. <laughs> and this is something, again, American Jews don't. It's not liberal and conservative in the American model because you're dealing with the existential reality mm -hmm. of the Jewish state. Mm -hmm. And I, this, I keep saying the Jewish state is not some abstract idea. The Jewish abs, the, the state of Israel is human beings. Mm -hmm. It's Jews. It's you and your wife and your daughters. And I want to say something else which is definitely above my pay grade. It's something which is more spiritual. I would, you know, let the rabbis discuss it. But there is something here which I think is more than a sign. You know, had the, I'm just thinking to myself, had the Palestinians accepted the 47 partition or the 37 partition, I'm not sure we would be here today. Yes. I'm not sure. Even the 67. Explain why. Because if you look at the map, the border was so vulnerable that, you know, we, we were kind of different, you know, enclaves. And it wasn't defensible. So you ask to, I'm asking to myself, what, are they stupid? Why didn't they do it? You know, Takia, they could have said yes and then attack us. Well, there's something, I guess, deeper than that, and it must be an act of God. Just like uh, the God hardened the heart of Pharaoh, he hardens the heart of the Palestinians. And the fact is that the more they say no, the more they attack us, we get stronger. So I will leave it up for you and the no, viewers no, 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 to no, no, think no. about it. You're the rabbi in this case. No, no. <laughs> All right, before we end, go through a couple of these parties and tell me what you think of them and begin with the Blue and White Party. Okay? So the okay. Blue and White Party is now a coalition of a number of very outstanding personalities on the Israeli scene, right? We've got Yair Lapid yeah. and we've got Benny Gantz. Mm -hmm. You've got two other former mm -hmm. chief of staffs. Right. And again, to the extent to which security drives electoral votes, mm -hmm. blue and white seems to have to be appealing. And yet you're still thinking that they would not ultimately have more votes and be able to create a coalition government instead of yes. Netanyahu. Yes. Why? Two reasons. Why? First of all, it's a, the blue and white is amalgamation of too many diverse uh, people and, uh, and, and parties, which don't have too much uh, together except to bring Bibi down. And that's not, I don't think this is a, a, a positive thing to run on. And uh, secondly, they don't have any coherent platform. Mm -hmm. So, so far, you don't know what do they think. Not about two-state solutions or one state, not about the economy, nothing at all. So they have the advantage of being the new guy in the block, so it's kind of attractive. But uh, I'm not sure that they will survive after the elections because their, their objective is to bring Bibi down. Let's say they succeed. What is the next day? What are they doing the, the next day? They have no clue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. 
It's interesting because each one of these are personalities in their own right. Absolutely. They are all very great people. I, Bogi Alon, yes. you know, which is today a sworn political enemy of Bibi Netanyahu. Yes. But he is a worthy guy. I know him very well. You know, he has done a lot for Israeli security. He is a great uh, strategic mind. He is an honest man. Uh, but, you know, with all the others, you know, they have too many generals and uh, not uh, <laughs> foot soldiers. <laughs> all right. Uh, but with the way it was, it's, they're arguing is if they win, they're going to split the role of which prime is, minister. Which, and, is, and, and which is also, I can tell you, it's a mockery. It's abuse of power. You want a prime minister, you need him to be in power and, 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 and implement his policies. It's not just a trophy that you give, that you can share. Okay, but you know, Rabin and Paris did it. And I think also it was wrong. Okay, and, and very good, absolutely. very good, okay. There's something called the New Right Party with Naftali Bennett, Ayala Chaked, and Carolyn Glick. What appeal does it have on the Israeli scene? I think the appeal that they have is that they extracted themselves from, we talked about it, from the let's say, the um, hands of the rabbis. You know, why, the, why did they leave? They left because they felt they were in the hands. They couldn't do independently what they wanted to do because uh, when they wanted to go for one policy, Bibi Netanyahu would have gone to the rabbis of, uh, you know, like Rabbi Drukman and all the others. The rabbis would have put the pressure on them and they were so... What they did is now freeing themselves from a, um, a let's say, political or rabbinical pressure, which may not belong in politics. Uh -huh. They may be appealing more to the non-religious, and so far they have very strong showing. They have very in the polls. They have strong showing, much more than the Baiti who did that they left. Interesting, isn't it? Yes, they have doubled, if not more. So. If there were a coalition government, they would be in the coalition oh, absolutely. government. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Lieberman would be in the government too, or no? I, well, I don't think so. He is really sliding because he has been in politics for so long. And you, you say, you know, you can uh, cheat some of the people some of the time. <laughs> you can cheat some of the people all the time, but not all the people all of the time. He has been tested in too many positions which he failed, including okay. the Minister of Defense. So you see in the polls, he is kind of scratching the threshold. I don't think anyone, anyone will be sore. And also there is no need. You know, he came on a, uh, for the Russian Jews in Israel. The Russian Jews in Israel don't need him now. They're part and parcel of the Israeli society. Yes. Their children are doing great and everybody. So I think he may... Uh, may not uh, make it this time. And you know, you, you have an, uh, a right evolution of Israeli okay. democracy. Avi Gabay, and I don't think Israel, American Jews understand who he is. And the report we get is he's responsible for sort of the political death of Tzipi Livni, yes. who was part of politics for a long time yes, and yes. now announced she's done. Yes. Well, here I can, I, I'll say two things. First of all, Abi Gabay has no experience in politics. You know, he was an executive. By the way, he was the director general of who? Of Bezek, the same company of Shaul Alovich, right? That is now involved in this uh, bribery case. Um, so uh, he has not uh, really uh, done really well for the party. You can see it in the polls. This I, is the Labour Party. This is the Labour, this which is, is... This was one time the Supreme Party in Israel. It is very sad. The Labour Party has so much, uh, 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 you know, uh, I would say uh, founding stocks in the state of Israel. You know, with Ben-Gurion and Golda Meir. Yes. And it is really sad to see. It is really sad to see. I, 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 I don't wish for them to disappear, but it's, it's like this is the, 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 the path they, they're walking. Uh, I think he didn't uh, do right by Tzipi Livni in the way he did it. So that's not going to gain him any, uh, any support or... Uh, do you expect him to be in a coalition government? Yes. Interesting. Yes. He will be necessary. If it will be necessary, absolutely. You know why? Because if he doesn't, he will disappear. If he doesn't become a, uh, 
a minister of uh, treasury or minister which will give him a lot of oxygen to run on for the next elections, they will disappear. So they will do it. Okay. My last issue for you has to be, again, comes back to how American Jews view Israel, Israeli politics, Prime Minister Netanyahu. There have been a couple of issues which have seemed to have created a, a, a wider gap that Israelis and Jewish leaders here are concerned with. That there, We don't want there to be a detachment within American Jewry from the state of Israel. So people were very, very upset when Prime Minister Netanyahu went along with the Orthodox when they scuttled the, West, the Western Wall deal. But there was going to be a, there still is going to be, but there was going to be a formal third section by Robinson Arch where egalitarian services could be held, men and women could be together, women could read from the Torah, women could do anything they wanted at this egalitarian section. And Natan Cherensky, when he was with the Jewish Agency, seemed to have worked out a deal. The deal was in place. Everybody said yes, including the Orthodox parties. And then at the last moment, there was an, an issue. The issue ostensibly was how many gates would there be into the Western Wall area the Sharansky group wanted there to be one gate. Everybody goes through the great gate, and then you determine where you want to go. And the Orthodox said, no, that elevates this third section to equal status with the classical section at the Western Wall where there's men and women, with the Mechitza, and therefore we're pulling out of the deal. And Prime Minister Netanyahu did not say to them, well, I'm keeping the deal no matter what. The deal falls apart, and there are American Jews who just see red and claim that Netanyahu betrayed them, that Israel has betrayed them, and that there's a feel that, they, that if American Jews who are pluralistic, and if they're Reform Jews, conservative Jews, Reconstructionist Jews, non-Orthodox Jews, even modern Orthodox Jews here in America, mm -hmm. if they can't go and be treated the way they want to be treated at the Western Wall, Israel is saying to them, we don't give you status, we don't recognize you as Jews, you're second-class people, and we and somehow are creating a breach between American Jewry and the state of Israel. That combined with this new basic law, which also just got American Jews all in a tither because it seemed to be anti-democratic. Although all it tried to do was say, Israel is a Jewish state, has the right to symbolism of a Jewish state. The state of Israel has one formal language, Hebrew, although it has a second language with special status, Arabic. Just American Jews went nuts. And American Jews, especially within the non-Orthodox world here in America, seem to feel that some of the things that Israel has done of late has made them feel further apart from the state of Israel. I want Denny alone to okay. speak to that. Okay, so I see here two different issues. The nation state law, all those who criticize it are hypocrites. I'll tell you why. We talked before about the Arab members of Knesset who can uh, preach for the destruction of the state of Israel, and they can do it. I, I didn't hear any of those who uh, criticize this law criticizing them. This law is specifically was made, you know, we, we discussed before this political correctness. Why do we not say that, uh, you know, this uh, Arab Israelis, you know, should not, uh, you know, if they wish us harm, we have the rights. The, the minimum that we could do is legislate this uh, law of the Jewish state uh, uh, that to show that and, and to defend against all those Israelis, mostly Arabs, but they're also Jewish Israelis, who are not believing in a Jewish state. So this is number one. So I'm all for it. About the issue of the, the Kotel, if we go back early on to what I told you about Bibi Netanyahu, I said he's a great prime minister, but I have one issue with him, that he doesn't do enough to do the Keruv, mm -hmm. to, to bring together 
uh, Jews from different uh, walks of lives, and this is exactly what I meant. I think Bibi made a mistake. What should he have done? He should have taken Sharansky's, um, uh, Sharansky's deal, which was good for everyone, and you know what? The Sharansky deal was also, initially, was also accepted by the religious parties. Yes. But what happened? All of a sudden, the rabbis of the religious parties told them otherwise. And he should have taken it all the way and not capitulate, um, even if it would have brought another election. You know, it's even if it would have brought his government yes, down. Yes, he should have done it. And he would have won big because most Israelis would have respected that and voted for him. That was a, a, a mistake. And again, I, I, I feel bad for that. Jews are Jews are Jews, whether they are Reform of or course, Orthodox of or conservative or modern or whatever. And you know something else which upset me? Rabbi Lukstein from KJ, a great rabbi. Esco Lukstein. Yes, he is the rabbi who converted and married um, Ivana Trump. Ivan, right, to, to, to Jared, Jared Kushner. Jared Kushner. This, and he is a, a modern Orthodox, a Correct. Orthodox rabbi. Modern Orthodox. That was not accepted by the rabbis in Israel. Right. It's a monopoly. Right. But what happened? She became the daughter of the president. Yes. So the rabbis all of a sudden do accept it. So this is also something with, uh, as we say, tam mifgam. There is something really flawed in what is going on with religion and state in Israel. And for that, you need leadership. And whoever be the next prime minister after Bibi Netanyahu, and maybe even Bibi himself, after you know exonerated, he, I hope, will do something to, to be more forceful and to work not only for the rabbis in Israel, but for the Klal Am Israel, for the oh, entire people of Israel. You say it again so beautifully, so perfectly. Why do Israelis tolerate it? Why do Israelis tolerate it? Because they don't know anything better. Israel never, you know, with the reestablishment of Israel, never was there a constitution, never was there a separation between religion and state. A part of it was because there were not uh, agreement. Uh, Ben-Gurion ben also did not really, couldn't dream that 400 uh, yeshiva buchers that were allowed not to get drafted would become all of a sudden 30,000. So these are things still that we are only, as a modern state, we are only 70 years old. It's very, very young. So there's a lot to be done, and I'm very optimistic. So you're not being, you're not running in these elections. No. No. But maybe you will in the future because we miss you. <laughs> no, your voice is a very important I, voice. I, I, I'm, I'm hoping one day you're prime minister, Danny. Mark, you are very flattering and very kind. I will tell you one thing. If I ever ran again, it's not because I'm obsessed with power. It's not because I want to occupy a seat. I've done there. I've been there. If only if I could make a difference. If I could make a difference, and I know that I, and I mean I know what to do. But if I will have a way to do, it's not just a matter of what to do, but how to do it. If I will have the capabilities, if I will have political support, if I will see a, a path that will not compromise my my values and thoughts. I don't uh, rule out. You're not out. ruling it out. I'm not ruling out anything. <laughs> but but uh, to tell you um, that it's in the offing, I don't uh, see far enough yet. But well, I, I hope that, it's, that if somebody as nice as you can still survive <laughs> Israeli politics. <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Yeah. We've only scratched the surface. You know, it's amazing. But there's no one like you. Oh, you're so and, you and you know how much I value Thank you. Not only your mind, but your heart and your friendship. I love you very, very much. Thank you always you. have a home here. Thank you. Okay. So we just continue, yes? Absolutely. We continue. This was just part three out exactly of hundred. Exactly right. Denny Ayalon, former Israeli ambassador to Washington, former Israeli deputy foreign minister, a visiting professor of Israeli politics at Yeshiva University and Stern College, and the host of a wonderful series you see here on JBS, 
the truth about Israel. There's no one who says it like Danny I alone, and it is, I, it is a privilege to be able to bring him to you and for you to learn with me so much about Israeli life today. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed here on this edition of L'Chaim by Danny or by myself. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook page, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'Chaim, my friends, and life. of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.